So we're going to start right away. So Dr. Davidovich is walking. It's all ready to go. I, he told me, he said, don't introduce me like I'll do something quick, quick. But I, please look at his bio. It's so interesting. So just quickly, I know he doesn't want me to uh, say too much, but he has a degree in psychology from Barcelona, a medical degree in, from Argentina, an MBA uh, in Switzerland. He's been coaching all around the world. So it's an honor to have Dr. Davikovic Thanks. that uh, I know I need to call Carlos. So <laughs> here it is, Carlos. Thanks. Give me five more minutes, right? Five more minutes, please. Okay, let's see if that's going to work. Yeah, it does. Great. So, I'm really delighted to be here, and good morning, everyone. I know it's before lunch. That's not nice. But worse will be after lunch. So, that's a really worse time to talk. So, very fast. I, I supposed to have something to present. I mean, in the way to present myself, I cannot use it, the computer. Anyway. My name is Carlos, and uh, originally, as you already know, I'm not from here. I'm from Argentina originally, but in 2000, I moved to Europe. I started living in Europe. My two professions, I mean, the first one is medical doctor. I'm a medical doctor. I was practicing medicine for many years, and I went through to pharma business, pharmaceutical business, in one specific area called biotechnology. It's very the science fiction of pharma, let's say. That was the blooming of the 90s. That was amazing. And then I said again in 2000, I moved to Europe and I changed everything. <laughs> and I changed uh, every uh, side of my life. And I started working in what I'm doing now. What I do now is executive coaching. I coach people one-on-one -on -one or teams. And uh, I work in one area, it's quite new, and we call it neuro management. In few words, is how to translate a lot of information that is coming from science to business and organizations in general. It's about human behavior, but with a different support. So I think that's enough. 2013, I came to live to Toronto, and I'm living and working in Toronto from yeah, April 2013. I came here because I love winters. And I'm totally a liar. And uh, so anyway, I'm happy to be here. And thanks a lot for this opportunity. I have just one hour. I'm asking for my 10 more minutes I, with all the technical issues. But we will talk now, let's say, before to introduce the topic itself, I mean, about from overwhelmed to flourishing, I want to, in, in less than seven minutes, to introduce a big idea, the framework that I, I always like to share about the brain. And for that, let's see, yeah, it's working. Just to share with you that in the 90s, this decade, all these people, mainly US Congress, European Union, that's okay, yeah, it works. They decided to put a name to this decade. and was named the decade of the brain. Now we are in 2016. And this decade has already a name. And the name is the decade of the mind. Even though the United States wants to change it, they say that we need to call the century of the mind. Because every single paradigm in the way we thought that we think is totally different now. Question to the audience, how many brains do we have? Any answer is OK, it's right. Please? One, that's good, what else? Two, any other option? This is looking like an auction, right? <laughs> any other option? No? One, two? The first part of the information is known information, but I want to share it and to put all of us on the same page, okay? So, we can say that we have one brain, if we take into account only this one as a, as a whole, and that's correct. And now, before lunch, I want to make you to do an exercise. Can you stand up, please? It's one minute or less. Please, with the right foot, move it clockwise. Clockwise in the air. You can lean in the table if you want. And with the right hand, write the number six in the air. Six. It's lovely to see it. From here, it's a fantastic show. I tell you. So I, 
if you practice, you can do it. And those of you that think you're doing it right, look at your foot because for sure you change it <laughs> to the other side. I can see it from here. So what I did is to send two informations. You can sit down, thanks. Two information to different part of your brain. And there was a crash. Unless you practice. If you can practice, you can do it. We can say, and you know this, it's known information based on what Sperry said in 1981. He got the Nobel Prize for this, that we have two different brains, or let's say specializations. And you know that the left one we call the linear thinking, and mainly is in charge of storage and information. It's where the alphabet is, not the language. Numbers is the way that we can organize information is in the left brain and is the area of the comfort zone. Just because of the time, we will not go there, but this is very important in our brain to keep us all the time in the comfort zone. And there is a reason behind. The right lobe, we call it the holistic thinking, is mainly in charge of sensing what's going on around me all the time. It's like a radar, yeah? If something is dangerous around me. It's lack of the concept of time in the way we think. We think about past, present, and future. In the emotional brain, everything I feel is now, is present time. Even though the event was many, many years ago, it doesn't matter. But if I have an emotional feeling, it's today. Is where the feeling of to be connected is mainly in the, le in the right brain. And is where we call imagination and creativity is located. This is an oversimplification, okay? But it helps us to understand a different way to see our brain, to understand our brain. We can go one step farther, and we can say, based on what McLean said many years ago, through evolution, we didn't replace brain. We will add in one over the other. So we, have, we can say we have three brains, a very primitive one that is here, the second one is this one, the yellow, that is not yellow here. And the third one, the third one is, and the only one that makes us human beings is there. The most primitive one, as you know, maybe most of you, is what we call reptilian or the lizard brain. And this is in charge of very, very basic functions, black and white. So sleep to be awake, to eat, to attack or to, or to flight, and to make love. Period. So, sustenance, survival, and sex. Those are the functions. The second one, we need more brains, okay? That's not enough. So, paleo mammal, it's what we share with horses and big apes. And this is, let's call it the emotional brain in general. This is very important in our life as a human. And the last one, the only part of our brain that makes us human being is here, it's technically called the neocortex, and is where all the learning functions are. But it's too new, it's a too new, this software. Where does the most powerful magnetic and electrical field in the body come from? If you were fast enough, you already know. Where it comes from? The brain, no. Elec the body has electrical waves, yeah? Because that's why we measure with different devices. But the most powerful is not here. The most powerful is in our heart. And one guy, many years ago, found out that in our heart, we have neurons, same cells that in our brain. And he called it the small brain here. We don't know still exactly what that means, but in our heart, we have thousands of neurons. And if you think, my, my native language is Spanish, but in English, how do you say when you know something very well? How do you say it? What is the English saying? You know it by heart, right? And when I was thinking that that sounds strange, why I know it by heart? Now, science is finding out that maybe the heart storage information. And I give you one, another anecdote. I don't have too much time for many anecdotes. I have a list of anecdotes, but not today. So another anecdote is people that receive a cardiac transplantation, some of them, after the surgery, they start having different dreams, different hobbies, different behavior. One guy, that, a group of people, they thought there was 
too weird. So they studied the donors. Those were the characteristics of the donors. So the heart was storage in information, and not only that, was sending the information to the brain and told to the big one, say, hey, do it, take it. So what we know, and still is under study, it's just, I would say, anecdotal information, but it's, those are facts. The big brain sends a lot of information to our heart, but at the same time, our heart is giving orders to the big brain. So they are interacting all the time. And I will not stop here. I will go one step further. Not only we have neurons in our heart, we have neurons in our gut. So this famous gut feeling also now, we are finding some kind of scientific support. Our gut, they have hundred millions of neurons. We have more neurons here than the whole spinal cord. And they say that if this one will not be thinking, this will be thinking somehow. Not only that the big brain sends information to the guts, but the guts sends 10 times more information to the big brain. And one substance called serotonin, doesn't matter, it's technical, but this serotonin is involved in what we call happiness. 90%, 9 zero, is produced in our gut, not here. That's one of the reasons that the, our mood is so much connected with our digestive system. And I will not give you any details. <laughs> so, when, when our mood is not good, this is affected and vice versa. It's bidirectional. So, metaphorically, we can say that we have five brains. And the only thing I want to highlight is that from the five, only one, that, what is here, sorry, here, only one, we call it rational. 20% of the five, right? The other 80% are linked with emotions. And that's why you will see, and I will say it at the end, how much emotions we are and how much we need to learn how to deal with our emotions. Because that's what, mainly what we are. This guy, the American poet, he has a very nice quote. He says, the brain is a wonderful organ. It starts working as soon as you wake up. And it does not stop until you get to the office. <laughs> Leader's ability. Any leader in any position, in any organization, is using all the time the five. To set strategy, the rational brain is essential. To empathize with others, then is the emotional side. But to take risk without a rational support, only we can do it with this. And I want to share a very short story. When I started with all this stuff in Europe many, many years ago, I was kind of I don't know, afraid, scared of how people are going to take it, you know, I mean, to, to, I was mainly talking to executive people in companies until today after hundreds and hundreds, maybe thousands, I don't know, of people that share these stories, none told me, I don't know what you're talking about, Carlos. Everybody said, of course I know when I have information from here. The point is that my team is telling me we need to go there, and this says, no, we need to go there. And when they ask me why, I don't know what to say. And then when I coached them, I said, don't worry, the alphabet is not here, that's why. But if you feel something that says, go to another direction, just take your time, the information will come. But at least learn how to decode that information. I mean, it sounds familiar? Makes sense so far? Hello, somebody home? Okay, I don't know, maybe you say no, you're absolutely nuts. Okay, that's fine, I take it. Another critical point, decisions. Our five brains are involved in any decision-making process. But the final weight of our decisions, consciously or not, lies in our emotions. Give me one second. The rational brain is not prepared to make decisions. 
the switch to make a decision is in the emotional brain, in human being. So the two has to be to connected. I'm not saying rationality is not useful. It's fine. I mean, it's amazing. I mean, we need it. But at the end, they need to be connected with one part of our emotions that we will be able to say, let's go. Make sense? Oh, gosh, so much silence. It's not moving. Hello? Now, anybody speaks Mandarin in the audience? Okay. This is, you know that in Mandarin, in Chinese, they use ideograms, images. They don't go through the alphabet. This is the ideogram in Mandarin or Cantonese. It's the same for the word, no? Javier? Thinking. And for the word thinking or the concept of thinking in Chinese, the upper part is the brain, represents the brain, and the lower part represents the heart. Do I need battery? <laughs> because it's not working. So they knew 5,000 years ago that to think we involve the heart. This guy, Donald Kane, he's a medical doctor living in, here in uh, uh, Canada. He has a very nice quote. The essential difference between emotion and reason is that emotion leads to action, while reason leads to conclusions. Clear about this? That's the way we are. That's the way we behave. Emotion and motivations, they have the same Latin root. The two words means movere, to take action. So we are able to move through our emotions, not through our rational brain. We need the rational brain, but at the moment we need to move, we go with our emotions, always. This group exercise will take five minutes. <laughs> you have in your table a, a list of questions or comments. Yeah, questions, let's say. Those are the questions you're supposed to have there. Take five minutes just to share with the people in your table some ideas. We don't have time that each table will go through the five, but you can choose one, and just to discuss and to talk in your table about this, please. Let's take five minutes for this, and then we'll start with the second part. Clear? You are alone, you don't have nobody to discuss with. <laughs> you need it.
I know it's not enough time, I know that. I'm compressing a seminar of four hours in one, so. Let's share, let's share some of the ideas. What, what does bring, being overwhelmed mean for you? Let's, let's hear from you one or two definitions. Words. You don't need to do the definition. Fruit. Yes. What else? Helpless. Ineffective. Sorry? Yep. What else? Panic. Panic. Of course. It's very personal how we react, but it's totally true. Any other word? Sorry? Anxiety. It's always there. We don't recognize it. We don't put the name, the label, you know, but anxiety is always there. This guy's of many other things. Concrete situations when you felt overwhelmed by your professional client. You can talk about your clients here, no problem, okay? One or two examples. Yes, please. Yeah, I think the most difficult for me has been when I was dealing with uh, a business situation where there was time deadlines and, and I don't have all the information I want. You know what I want. And then the student calls me about the problem. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> Which I'm now told is due. So I've got two things going on at the same time. Exactly. So things are coming. Another real example from your li real life. Any example? Please? Yes. Can you give an example? A situation, concrete situation. Or anybody, any, anyone else? Yep. Yeah, you need to change. Boom. Totally. Any other one? No. What about physical and emotional manifestations? So let's do a popcorn style. I mean, just saying things from everywhere. Sorry? Your shoulders like this, exactly like this. It's very visual. I like it. I feel it all the time. What else? They start to sweat. Yeah, what else? Ah, you start yeah, blaming others. Yeah, exactly. What else? Sorry, you said something here? Okay, what else? More. Exhausted. What else? Lack of sleep. We, let's call it sleep disorders. Could be people lack of sleep or they start sleeping 24 hours or 24 7. What else? Digestive problems. I will not ask any detail. But it's absolutely true all the time. Most all the time. Most all the time that happens. What else? Sorry? Can you speak up a little bit? Yeah, grumpy. Yeah, yeah. More than ever. Yeah. <laughs> what else? Sorry? Exactly. Any other thing? Any other symptom? Could be, I said, a physical, emotional. And they, are in the, they go in the same bucket, let's say. They are connected. Any other one? There are many. We can build a list if we have time, right? Actions. What do you do to overcome this state? Techniques. Uh, I will share some. <laughs> but all of you, you have your techniques. That's why, with all respect, you're still here. <laughs> you survived. So you know how to survive stress, yeah. Uh, I use physical exercise. Exercise, what else? Delegate, Delegate. yes. Make yeah, make a list. How many of you make the, the to-do list? Okay, second question, I love the answer. How many of you go back to that list? <laughs> what a bunch of liars. <laughs> <laughs> we never go back to that list, we just do a new one. <laughs> At least that's what I do, but it makes me calm, you know, to make the list. I love it. <laughs> what else? Another, yes. Sorry? Look out the window if you live in a nice place. 
What else? Eat. Yes. Again, it's eating disorders. Could be that you eat too much or you stop eating. Yes. Fight or flight. In other words, fight, dig into everything, or flight, step out of the office and take a walk. Yeah. Depends on the situation, right? Yeah. Any, any, yeah, please. Sorry. Say. Exactly. Or start venting. Yeah, that's very good. And as you can see, everything is about how to, let's say, release energy, right? To others, to ourselves, somehow. It's about too much energy to manage. What does flourishing mean to you? Mm -hmm. Adaptations to change. What else? Confidence. Confidence. Like it. Any other word? Delegation. Delegation. We are delegating a lot here in this area. <laughs> what else? Productive. Productive. Happy. Exactly. Calm. What else? See? Yeah. Feeling of harmony. Yeah. Anything else? Satisfied. Satisfied. Everything is fine. The technical definition of being overwhelmed is very simple and it's very general. It's feeling completely overcome in mind and emotions. I cannot manage. You know, so it's lack. You didn't say it in this word, but I'm sure you thought about it. Lack of control. We didn't mention, we didn't share this way to say it. But that's a feeling, lack of control. I lost control. Emotional symptoms. You already talked about that. Sadness. Overreacting, fear, anger, depression, helpless, inability to decipher on thoughts and from reality, anxiety, we, we, we named almost all of them, irritability, abnormal crying. Panic attack, also we talk about panic in one moment at the beginning. Physic, uh, physiological ones, breath, shortness of breath, tingling, chest pain, oversleeping or non-sleep, Sweating, we said it. Sensitivity to infections, fast heartbeat, yeah, tachycardia, right? Sometimes also, depends on the person. There is something called the general adaptation syndrome. This was described in 1930 by one guy called Hans Selye. He was a European guy from Hungary, I think, but he lived all his life in Canada. And he described this general adaptation syndrome is the first guy that mentioned the word stress. And what he found out was that there is a level of, let's say, little stress that is not productive. As a technical definition, without stress, we die. Clear about that? It's not about the stress. It's about the amount of stress, the level. Okay? So... We need stress to live, stress is to be active, to be in our good shape. But this is, the, he called it the optimal stress. And in one moment, we cross this line and we go to exhaustion, yeah, too much, and can be even worse, the red side. So there is a continuum that many times we don't register when we are going from the yellow to the orange side. Clear about this? Another thing I want to share with you is called the basic rest and activity cycles. And that means, in general, and oversimplifying again, the five brains, they have an activity time. Now we know that the brain has specific highways. The activity time is a highway called the task positive network. It's when we are doing something. Yeah? It's an oriented task. Action, sorry. And this is the rest time. And the rest time has a very negative marketing. I don't know if you agree with me. When we need time, we sacrifice this all the time. Yes or no? And we start saying, okay, I will sleep less. We can work in the weekend. I work 24-7. And also, the rest time is represented by a highway in the brain called the default mode network. What we don't know in general, what is the function of this one? And it's very important, and I want really to share this with you because I want to share how important it is that we 
will let us rest during the day. The rest time has a very specific function. The function is the same as the computer. It's a data backup storage information. When we rest, the brain is working the most. It's organizing all the information that then after we will be able to use it. It's like, a, you understand what I'm saying? If we don't organize our desk from time to time, I mean, we don't know where the things are and it will take a lot of time, a lot of energy. The brain does exactly the same. So if we don't give this time, this rest time, the brain cannot do it. But for your information, the brain will take that time anyway. Even though we say, I will not sleep, I will not rest, the brain will oblige us, will block us, and those are those moments that we are in front of the computer doing nothing. And I don't know if you heard people say, I was eight hours working today. It's absolutely a lie. Nobody can work. The brain cannot work eight hours. Not 10, not 12. It's doing on, off, on, off with certain rhythm. This is the way to organize the ongoing activity and then the activity time will be more productive. So the rest time is the only way that we can increase the productivity of the activity time. This is common sense, but now we know why. We didn't know the why before. The I feel guilty box is everywhere. If I rest too much, then there is a little voice saying, you are procrastinating, right? Sounds familiar? It's too much rest. No, come on. It's the rest I need. Well, some people rest all day. I mean, this is a different point. <laughs> Are we not there? We talked all the time about time management, and this is the wrong target. What we are doing and dealing every day is with energy management. And this is no touchy-feeling thing. This is a fact. It's not about time. 24 hours is a fixed factor of the equation. We cannot change it here in China or Antarctica. But the way we manage our energy, yes. And that what makes the difference. We think wrongly that we are linear beings. That means in the morning, a lot of energy. In the night, lack of energy. It's not exactly like this. We are mainly oscillatory beings. During the day, we have two basic rhythms. Number one is called circadian rhythm, but that's a matter of the name. And that is a lot of energy in the morning, not all of us, most of us. And then we go down between one and three, our energy really goes down. And then we recover and we can keep working. Sorry. When this is about what we make show at least in North America, when they say the Latin American people and the siesta time. The siesta time, yeah, exactly, Javier, yeah, you know what I'm talking about. Siesta time is a physiological process. The brain will do it all the time, will lower the level of energy. There was a fantastic work done by the American Science of Cardiology 20 years ago, 25 years ago. Companies, people were resting 15 to 20 minutes, no more, after lunch. And the other group, no rest. Those people that were resting, not necessarily sleeping, they increased productivity. It was, it was off a chart, the number. And at that moment, I was in Argentina. When we were reading that article, we said, OK, finally, the United States I mean, discovered the siesta and the nap time. The other rhythm is the ultradian rhythm. And this one is different. This is also called the 90-20 rhythm. Every 90 to 120, that is variable, depends on the person. But let's say 100 minutes, the brain will shut off for around 15 minutes. Are those moments that we are not so productive. But if you, if you think about this, it's, it's similar to our daily rhythm. We got to the office, let's say whatever, seven, eight, an hour and a half after, we go for a coffee, right? And then lunchtime. And then another coffee in the afternoon, or just to walk around. And that's the way that we are following this natural rhythm called ultradian. What I highly recommend is to buy a timer. 
And every 90 minutes, whatever you are doing, change activity. Do other things. And the brain will be able to catch up with the energy. Do some activity that will not require so much energy. Answer some emails, not all the emails, some emails, or um, just uh, accommodating something, or go to talk to someone. Do some activity that will not require so much energy for 10 or 15 minutes. And then you will see the impact on productivity. Make sense what I'm saying? Are we okay so far? Which are you? Lark or now? Early bird? How many lark? How many early birds do we have here? How many owl? Almost 50-50. So we need to learn what is our rhythm because it's a way to take advantage of our energy. Myself, I tell you, I share with you, when I want, I need to do something that will require a lot of energy, concentration and thought, I do it in the afternoon, never in the morning. I know that I, I work better, and I think better, and I'm faster. I already know this, so I leave all the other act, uh, activities or meetings in the morning. Some people need to do exactly the opposite, and it's fine. Circadian and ultrarian, change activity every 90, 120 minutes, that will increase effectiveness and productivity. Let's go with the thriving formula, seven steps to thriving. There were more, but in one hour I cannot go through all of them. <laughs> Maybe we have a second part, right, next year. I promise to, to share the rest of the information. This is very important. Remember, do you know what is this? What that means? First, the oxygen mask, to your, oxygen mask to yourself. So, life lesson, put on your own oxygen mask before assisting others. This is essential. If not, you will not be able to help in a proper way, no one. So now we are talking about you. We talked about anxiety. Anxiety is always there. I want to give you an exercise, a formula. Anxiety has one characteristic. It's always linked to the past or to the future. Anx we are anxious about something that happened or didn't happen, and we are anxious about something that's going to happen, and we are not prepared, right? Anxiety doesn't have any space or place in the present time. Any technique that will bring you to the here and now will push anxiety away. I will not go through meditation, mindfulness, because that is a technique that you need to practice a lot and learn to be effective. I will share another one called the rule of five. And this technique you can practice this right now. It's very simple. It's based on the senses. At the moment that you feel anxious, stop whatever you're doing. And if you are by yourself, start saying out loud, referring five things, concrete things that you see around you. I see the cup of coffee or tea, uh, you know, I see the plate, I see the table, things that are there. That's a way to bring your mind to the present time. Then you switch to touch, things are touching me, more than five for sure. Hearing, sounds, taste and smell. Depends on the personality, will be easier one or the other. But go through this, and I said again, that needs a little practice. It's very easy to do. The more you practice, you do it like a game. And you will feel that in one moment anxiety just runs away. It's not there. It's no magic. It's about, it's about a space. If you bring yourself to the present, anxiety doesn't have any space to be. I'm clear about this? It's clear? Make sense? Yep? Okay. I said again, we cannot practice. Normally we practice during the workshop, and it's a lot of fun. <laughs> but it's just bring your mind to the present time. This is a technique used for people that, that uh, suffer of phobias. And phobias is one extreme of anxiety, right?
Do you know how to boil a frog? Please say it. Yep. <laughs> Everybody heard what she said? So to boil a frog, you need to put in cold water first. And you start warming up. In one moment, the frog doesn't, doesn't register the change of temperature. And it's done. I like this metaphor because it's exactly what happened to all of us. We start working and everything is fine. And in one moment, we get more job. And our boss say, hey, I have something else for you. Give it to me. And we don't register that the water is getting warmer. Do I explain myself? And in one moment, it's boiling. And we are burned out. We don't register that, that process because we think we can manage everything. Wrong. Sorry to tell you. Superman is a cartoon. Superwoman as well. Awareness of being overwhelmed. That's the number two. Do you know when you are overwhelmed or it's too late? Are you already burned out? To be aware is very important, but not only that, is to accept that you are overwhelmed, to be able to stop. Because normally I say, okay, I'm tired, but I will continue. I will do a little bit more. Yeah, one more hour. But you know that you are not producing as you should. And I tell you, the body is doing this, the brain is doing this. You will not be productive and you will start increasing the level of mistakes. Acceptance and awareness is the door to solutions. And there is a quote from Carl Gustav Jung, the Swiss psychologist. What we resist persists. It's not about, I'm okay. If I feel tired, stop. Because you will be more tired even. Three, this is called the energy balance chart. And we will not practice now, but you can take notes. Just build a chart with these four columns. And here write people, activity, and places. And first, second column, write down people, activity, and places that for you are energy sources. Means that you feel okay, you feel good when you are with these people, doing this activity, or when you go to certain places. Sometimes it's a coffee place around the corner of your house. That's it. But you feel good. Feel good, the translation for the brain is I'm gaining energy. This technique has thousands of years and was used by native people all over the world. They knew where to gain energy and what, that's the second one, people, activity, and places that energy suckers. This, is even, this, this column is more important. To avoid those people, activity, and places at the moment that we are low in energy. Because that drain energy. I highly recommend to do this exercise because it's very personal. At the moment you identify who is who or what, is, what places, start following this and you will see the difference. This is poor math, okay? <laughs> it's a fact. It's physics, no math. And the third, the last column is both people, activity or place for a while. They are energy sources and then they become energy suckers. Example, can you give me an example? Kids. I love my kids, but just after certain minutes, okay, <laughs> time out. <laughs> exactly. They have different energy than we have, level of energy. Change the meaning, another technique. This guy, Albert Elias, he describes something called the ABC model. That means A is about the adversity or the event, okay? The adversity, what happened to us. Normally, we connect the adversity with the consequence, or I, I said it the opposite. The consequences with the adversity. And what he said is, this is wrong. The consequence of any event, it doesn't depend on the adversity. It depends on what? 
In another words, in that line, yes. Another way to say exactly the same? B. Belief. Is the way we build the story is not about the event. Clear what I'm saying? And this is not philosophy, this is a fact. Because all of you, and I said again, sorry I'm repetitive, but we don't have time, to share stories that in one moment, one event was very negative, and then we changed the meaning, and we understood there was positive at the end. And then the emotional impact is totally the opposite. Make sense what I'm saying? I love this quote. Be careful how you are talking to yourself because you are listening. <laughs> and we believe what they say, what we say to what we tell to ourselves. That's the problem. The past is a story we tell ourselves. Change the story, change the meaning. This is an exercise. Yeah? I know, I'm not trying to play optimist all the time and say maybe there's a different meaning, and when we change the meaning, automatically we'll change the emotional impact. Clear? This already we talked about, identify and follow your physiological cycles, owl, lark, whatever, and the 90, 20. Do you want that your work will be a work of quality, yes or no? Oh, yeah, it's a rhetorical question, right? Do you want to be productive? Then, when you are overwhelmed or you are in the process please stop multitasking isn't that nice the brain is not prepared for multitasking cannot do it and I know a lot of your brain mind are saying Carlos you are wrong I'm great multitasking no you are great in changing activity very fast that's different, and women are more prepared than men. That's true, this is a fact. But it doesn't mean you are more productive. You are doing less of each thing, of many things. Well, we know today that 98% of population, when they do multitasking, they decrease productivity. And don't tell me that you are in the 2%. I'm not saying because it's impossible to say to stop multitasking. I'm not saying that. I'm saying at the moment you are tired or you feel overwhelmed, start focusing. And the low level of energy, you sit in one thing. When we do many things, we're distributing the energy. So productivity goes and effectiveness goes down. This is a fact. There are many, many research on this if you want to read about it. So then, when you feel with energy, okay, go back to be multitasking. It's not a problem. But it's the wrong way to name it. We are not multitaskers. We are able to change activity many, uh, very fast. But we need to distribute the energy. Thanks a lot. I need that at least more than 50% and then I continue talking. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> Because I see people, but you are maybe not here. <laughs> this guy, Martin Seligman, this guy maybe is the most important guy nowadays in what is called positive psychology. He's called the father of positive psychology. He works in, Pens in Pennsylvania University. He was asked by the United States government, specifically U.S. Army, to prepare a program to deal with PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder, and to deal with stress. So he prepared a program called the PERMA program. And each letter has a different program by itself. It's a program by itself. P is positive emotions, E is engagement, R, positive relationships, M, meaning, A, accomplishment. I will not go through the program I will just highlight one or two things for today. But just I want to share because this program is nowadays being applied in US Army in one million people and is highly successful. From the PERMA, I want to just share with you something 
that is linked with positive emotions. Have you heard about this guy, the Losada Ratio? Yes or no? You don't have to. The team of Losada did the following thing. They went to 60 companies, 6-0. 20 stable companies. 20 companies that were going down. 20 companies that were succeeding. The only thing that they've done was to stay in their meetings and to record every single conversation. That's all. And then they analyzed how people were talking to each other during the meetings, the executive meetings, whatever meeting. And they found out that there was a ratio, a ratio that above that ratio, that company had high probability to be successful. Below that ratio was going to die. And the number was 2.9, okay, or 3, 3 to 1. The Lozada line means when in the communication process in the organization, people share three positive comments versus one, that, comment, that company high probability to be successful. I'm not saying to be happy. I'm saying the way they are dealing with problems. You can deal with problems in a positive way or in a negative way. We cannot do it. Yeah, that would be a negative way. So am I clear? It makes sense what I'm saying. The way they were talking to each other. If they're talking in a positive way regarding problems or they were talking in a negative way. No solutions. And the proportion was three to one. So I recommend you from tomorrow, any meeting, just record the meeting and start doing the analysis because this is very interesting. So they said three positive comments versus one, this will push the company in the right direction. The team of Losada did exactly the same with couples. The ratio was now 3-1. The ratio in couples relationship is 5-1. And they were able to predict divorce and people that were not getting along for a long time if the proportion was lower. No comments, okay? And when you go back to home now, I say, start listening while you're talking to me. What are you saying? Optimism does not imply denial. I don't, I'm not talking about happiness. I'm talking about optimism. It's a totally different thing. Optimism is the way that we are focusing on problems or focusing on solutions. The word problems should be there, exactly. But before, not now. This is what we call positive, the way I deal with problems. I, did, I deal with problems in a negative way or I'm trying to find a solution. So, positive is not about how people talk. What I mean is, maybe it's a crampy guy in my team, right? So the time, wah, wah, complaining. But at the moment that we are facing a challenge, it's the first one that will say, we will try, we will do it. Hey, I'm thinking about this. But it's not the guy who is smiling all day. Because maybe those that are smiling all day, they do nothing. I, I'm just exaggerating, just to, to give you an example. Make sense what I'm saying? So optimism is not to be smiling all day. It's about okay, actions, not talk. It's the way people behave. That's what we call optimism, optimist. And I will just share accomplishment because I like this. And it's... Your I can is more important than your IQ. Self-discipline and greed, they proved, Seligman and team, that values double than the IQ. And this is important when you are choosing your team members. Yep, because IQ is very important, it's not enough. What is the goal of what we call stress management? The goal is, do you know what this is this? What is this? This is a thermostat. The goal is to be a thermostat and not to be a thermometer. Do you know the difference? 
This depends on the environment, depends on the temperature around is my temperature. Here I establish my temperature and I decide for myself. I love this metaphor, I don't know, but I like it, that's why I'm sharing it. The thermostat, I put the temperature and I can manage myself. This is my control. Here I'm not controlling. Summary. We talked about the decade of the mind, right? Anybody remembers that we talked about this? <laughs> Today. <laughs> then we talked about the five brains. We talked also about the general adaptation syndrome, right? Emotional and physiological symptoms. We shared some of them. We talked about energy management and the inner physiological rhythm, the circadian and the ultravian. Also, we talk about the flourishing formula, anxiety, the rule of five. This is the way, why I do this summary? Because it's the way that the brain learns, by repetition. That's the only way that we learn. Awareness and acceptance. Third, the balance chart. Remember, energy sources, energy suckers. Four, change the story, change the meaning. Five, identify and follow your inner clock. Six, multitasking, stop, at least in those moments you feel low in energy. And, sorry, it should be seven, the PERMA program, positive emotion, the Losada ratio in particular. This guy, Antonio Damasio, maybe is the most important neuroscientist today. He works, I think, in San Diego. He has a fantastic quote. His quote is, we are not thinking machines that feel, but emotional machines that think. We are emotional beings with a brand new rational software. And still, we don't know exactly how it works. Imagine 2 million or 10 million years the emotional side, 40,000 years in the way we know it, the rational brain. Still, we don't trust too much. If we survive, it was for, because of the emotional side. That's why we still trust so much. Make sense what I said? And now, very, very fast, it takes one minute, promise. I, I will do a test to you. I will test how stressed you are. I tell you, because I need to speed up so much, I'm totally stressed right now. In the next slide, two identical dolphins will appear. Are you ready for the test? Watch carefully how both dolphins are jumping the waves. Although they are absolutely identical, people that are overwhelmed can perceive differences between them. Take a look at the slide, and if you find more than three differences, you are clearly overwhelmed. Are you ready? Everybody's ready? Yes or no? Yes. Thanks a lot. Thanks. Just in time. <laughs> okay, so we're all overwhelmed and uh, super stressed, so let's break for lunch. It's in room 105, just beside uh, the, the first room we were on, uh, we were in, sorry, and we will reconvene at 1.30 in room uh, 106 for another large plenary. So. Thank you all. Thank you again, Carlos. That was really, really interesting. Thank you.